Well, welcome to Thrive Church. I am so excited that you are here today. Are you excited to be here? Man, it is always so awesome to get together and sing praise and get into scripture. And uh, if you don't know me, I'm Judah Thomas. I'm lead pastor here at Thrive. And we are in a series called Seven Letters. These are seven letters that Jesus wrote to different churches uh, throughout Asia Minor. Uh, He inspired the apostle John to actually pin them. And these were carried to these various churches. And so we've been going through these over the last several weeks. We started with the church in Ephesus, and this was a church that, that worked really hard. They did a lot of good things, but yet they lost their first love. They lost their love for God, and they lost their love for others. Then we talked about uh, the church in Smyrna, and they were going through a lot of persecution. They were uh, being put to death for their faith. Last week, we talked about the church in Pergamum and the compromises that they were uh, making. So uh, we have some mail today uh, for you, but, but let me warn you. Let me warn you. You know, there, there's different kinds of mail that we get, right? Like there's some kind of mail that you get and you're like really excited to open it up. You're like, wow, this is so great. You know, it's a letter from grandma. It's probably got a $5 bill in it. This is great. There's other kinds of mail that we don't look for forward to. Like for example, the IRS, right? Yeah, you ever get that letter in the mail and it's not during tax season. It's like, huh, we have a few questions about your recent tax return. Now, now let, let me just be real here for a minute. This letter is kind of like that. I have wrestled with this letter all week. In fact, I, 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 this one has the most potential to upset people more than any of the other letters so far. And, and, and I'm, I'm actually nervous to preach this, okay? And, and the reason being is because this letter It has the the biggest opportunity for you to misunderstand maybe where I'm coming from, where Jesus is coming from, and and, and honestly, there's really no easy way to go through it. So we're just going to kind of jump in. And hopefully you guys can bear with me. And and, and I just want to get this out of the way that just so you know, as we're going through it, and if you're like, wow, I don't really like that, just realize that I don't really like it either, okay? So let's let's just be real for a moment. And, uh, and let's open up this letter. This letter is from Revelation 2.18. It says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. Now, again, I've mentioned this before. When it says the angel of the church, this was simply the pastor of the church, simply the one who would get up and read this letter to those gathered together. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire and whose feet are like polished bronze. Whose eyes are like fire. Now, I mean, already, this is kind of an intense beginning. Saying his eyes are like fire. I, I kind of picture it like, like, like Superman, like, like x-ray vision, like his eyes that can see through ev- me. He can see everything that I'm doing. He says his eyes are like fire and his feet are like polished bronze. This is to the church in Thyatira. First, we need to learn a little bit about the city though. And I think that'll help us to, to understand the context of this letter This was a a, a city that was a a major crossroads. It was a junction. Like not many people went to Thyatira, but everybody went through Thyatira. You know, this was was a blue collar city. This was a city where they made things. This was a city kind of like, like Waterbury maybe, you know? Like Waterbury here, it's a a city everybody goes through. I... I, I'm, not, I'm not hating on Waterbury, but nobody's going there for their honeymoon, okay? <laughs> Just being honest, that's like with Thyatira. It, 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 it's a city that made things, as Waterbury used to make things. I don't even know if we, they make things anymore. I don't know if we make many things around here anymore, but, but this city was a city that made things. And of all the seven cities, this was the smallest one, and quite frankly, it was the most least important 
city. It wasn't, you know, a, a major city where people would come to learn things and vacation. It was this trade city. And in this city were all of these trade guilds, kind of like a, a workers' union, like a labor union. And so all of these people, uh, depending on their trade, they would be involved with a certain guild in the city. They had uh, guilds for wool workers. They had guilds for people who made linen. They had guilds for people who, who, uh, who sewed uh, garments together. They had guilds for uh, people who dyed fabric. In fact, if you remember uh, a few weeks ago, we were talking about a, a woman named Lydia, and, and she was at the church in Philippi, and she was one of the first converts there, and if you remember her job was that she was a dealer in purple fabric. Scripture says that she was from Thyatira. See, that's where, where all of this, this purple dye was some of the, the most expensive uh, fabrics in the world. It was made there. And so she would travel there and, and invariably, I guess, importing that to her area and to her region. They also did leather craft. They had people who would tan uh, animal hides. They had potters. They had uh, bakers. They had bronze smiths. This was a hub of, uh, of commerce. They were known for their bronze weapons that were just shiny and gleaming, as you can imagine. And, and, and I find it interesting that when Jesus refers to himself, he kind of uses that same imagery. If you could imagine these people who spent their days working in a forge, working in, in the bronze, uh, you know, making bronze and, and hammering the bronze, and it says, this is coming from the Son of God whose eyes are like the flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. If you were a bronze worker, you would join the Bronze Workers Guild. As a result, all of the bronze workers would live in a, in a similar section of the city, and all the leather workers would live in another section of the city, and they all would worship together at the same temple. If you walked away from the guild, you were also walking away from your job. You were committing corporate suicide if you ever chose to leave this workers' guild. So continuing on in this letter, it says, whose feet are like polished bronze, verse 19, I know all the things that you do. Again, those, those x-ray vision, he said, I have been watching you. I see through everything that you're doing. I see what's going on in your life. I know all the things you do. I've seen your love and your faith and your service and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improvement in all these things. Now, this is pretty positive. This is pretty encouraging. He said, you are on a mission. I see how, how, how much passion you have for God and for other people. And you're getting better each and every day, it says. Because I can see your constant improvement in all of these things. Verse 20, but I have this complaint against you. Man. Don't you just love it when Jesus says that to you? Again, this is, like, this is like opening up the letter from the IRS. Like, oh, I have this complaint against you. It's like, oh, you got that pit in your stomach. What is he gonna say? I have this complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. He says, I see you. You're, you're doing good in these some areas, your faith, your service, your endurance, you're getting better, but you're tolerating some sin. See, Jesus, in all of these letters, he starts the letter with a compliment, right? And, I, and now, now in business school, they say, hey, whenever you, you know, correct somebody, always start with a compliment. Oh, I really like your hair today, but you haven't been showing up on time, so you better, you know, shape up or ship out. Jesus is kind of doing that, saying, oh, I see you've, you got some good things going, but I have this complaint. And not only are you allowing sin, but you're encouraging sin. It's interesting that the, the very first church we learned about was Ephesus, and they had the exact opposite problem. It says, I see that you're, you're working very hard. You're trying to stay very accurate to Scripture. You value truth, but you don't love me, and you don't love people. Here we see the opposite. Say, oh, I, I know that you love me. I know that you love people. But you're starting to tolerate sin, and not only tolerate sin, but embrace sin. In your notes, the love of God without the fear of God leads to compromise. 
Oh, I just love God. I love God. I love God. But if I don't have the fear of God, where I think I can just do anything I want in life and I'll never suffer any consequences for it, then that leads to compromise. They had a love for God, but they didn't have a fear of God. It says that they let this, this Jezebel. Now, I don't think this was her real name. Uh, this was kind of like, like a slur. This was like saying somebody is a Judas or, or somebody's a Benedict Arnold. They're a traitor. Jezebel was someone from the Old Testament. We know that she wasn't popular because any Bible name that we don't name our kids is usually a bad person, right? We, we don't name our kids Jezebel. We don't see like little Jezebels running around. Like, oh, look at little Jezebel. She's so cute. You know, we, we, we're, not, we're not naming our kids these things. This comes from First and Second Kings. We see that Jezebel was the wife of King Ahab and who was the king of Israel at that time. And she had political power, she had influence, she had financial means, and she could kind of do what she wanted. She would walk right over King Ahab, and she did things that dishonored God. Like, for example, she outlawed the worship of God in the very country that God founded. She, she put out a decree to, to kill all of the priests in the land, all of the prophets in the land that were still loyal to God, and she introduced a new religion. It was called Baal worship. Baal was a god where many people would worship throughout these ancient civilizations, and she introduced this into Israel. Basically, they were sexual perverts. That's what they were. They would come, and, and they would have these orgies in their acts of worship. They would have prostitutes that lived in the temple for people's sexual enjoyment. On top of that, they, they embraced child sacrifice. People, so many of you were getting pregnant and unwanted pregnancies. They're like, well, let's just offer them back to Baal. Throw them in the fire. I know this is dark and demented stuff, but this is what happened. This is, this is what Jezebel was, was promoting to God's people. So back to Thyatira. Every guild in the city had a God associated with that guild. The leather workers had a God and a temple that they would worship. And the, the bronze workers would have a God that they would worship. This is part of life in Thyatira. If you wanted a job, you were in a guild, and if you were in a guild, you worshiped the same God together. And this was, as you can imagine, a crisis for the Christians living in that era. The Christians who were committed to sexual purity, committed to the basic teachings of Jesus, where he said that the husband and wife should be united in marriage. Basic principles, but, but now there's all this promiscuity and, and he said, well, well, maybe they could just refuse to be involved with the guild. Maybe they could just, just skip out on what's going on. See, they couldn't because, see, what would happen? They would, they would have these parties, and this was all part of, of how they would live their life. The guilds would gather together. They would worship. They would do all of these things. And if you withdrew, then you lost your livelihood. You lost your house. You began to suffer. You were an outcast. So here's Jezebel. The Jezebel in this church introduced a new teaching. She says, you can have both. And isn't that good news? We can have both. We can have Jesus and all the orgies. We can have Jesus and still we can uh, eat the meat, sacrifice to idols. We can participate in idol worship just a little bit. We can have faith in Jesus and still sleep around with whoever we want. We can have both. Oh, you guys are just old-fashioned. We, we, we need to be progressive. Jesus forgives you, so it's okay. And that was a teaching that was going on in this church. But here's the truth of the matter in your notes, is that you can't serve Jesus and still do whatever you want. You can't serve Jesus and still do anything that you want, anything that feels good. There's this mentality in the world of if it feels good, do it. I'm just going to go around. I'm going to go along, do whatever I want. And as a result, we're abusing God's grace, saying, well, if Jesus forgives me, I can do anything I want. And as a result, we're slapping Jesus in the face, saying, I'm just going to abuse the grace that you've given me. And the problem that this church had and the problem that many have even this day is that the Christians were more tolerant than Jesus was. They were more tolerant of sin. And I know this is, I know this is heavy stuff. And, and like I said, I don't really want to preach it, honestly. I really don't. But, but it's in Scripture. He's saying, saying that this is what you need to read to the church. If this is your first time here, I'm sorry. Come back next week, okay? 
This is not about you. This is about us that come here and how God is trying to make our lives a little bit more difficult, okay? So this is for us. This is for those who are following Jesus, who have faith in Jesus Christ. That, that, that's for us. Are you a tolerant Christian? Open, diverse, progressive. I wonder, what are we tolerating in our own lives? What are we tolerating? The, the, the TV shows that we watch, the, 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 the little bit of dabbling into to porn, the, the strip clubs that we're going to, the romance novel that we're reading. Oh, it's just a little bit of fun. I, I hope you can hear my heart here. I, I'm not intolerant, but I have convictions. We all have to have convictions. I, I, I wonder... If the world is thinking about us, is, you know, is, is, is being a Christian, are they really tolerant? Are Christians tolerant? And the problem that we face is that the word tolerant has changed its meaning in the last 20 years. It used to mean, tolerance used to mean, I disagree with you, but I'll still love you and treat you with respect. That's what tolerance used to mean. It means I, I, I may not see eye to eye on you, but we can still get along. I can still love you. I can still be around you. But in our world today, if you aren't open and agree and celebrate every single thing, then you're labeled a bigot or prejudiced or discriminatory. And you have to approve of everybody. And it's not easy to talk about this because I want you to like me, quite frankly. And some of you are like, I don't like you right now. And I don't really either, but this is what is truth. This is what the world is doing. They're saying that, that oh, if, if, you're, if you tolerate us, that means that you approve of everything that we do. You know, I have friends, close friends that have different beliefs than me. I have friends that, that do all kinds of things. And, and when I'm around them, they don't feel judged. They know that we don't agree on everything. They don't agree with me. They don't even agree with the Bible. But yet I'm still called to love them and accept them as Jesus did. I'm, I'm called to love them and accept them as is. That doesn't mean I approve of everything in their life. In fact, it doesn't mean I approve of everything in my own life, if we're being honest about this. See, there's a big difference between acceptance and approval. In your notes, acceptance is showing love and respect to everyone because they're made in God's image. Acceptance says, I, I can love you, I can respect you because you are made in God's image, that you are worthy of love. It doesn't mean I approve of everything, but I accept you where you are. Jesus accepted everyone, regardless of their past, regardless of what they've done, regardless of their political beliefs, regardless of anything, Jesus always accepted them. No matter who they were, he accepted them. No matter what they did, he accepted them. No matter what they believe, he loves everyone. And as a church, as Thrive, we love you too. Wherever you are, whatever you've done, we love you. We accept you. But Jesus didn't approve of everything that they did either. Jesus doesn't approve of everything that you do. And quite frankly, Jesus doesn't approve of everything that I do. So I'm preaching to me as much as I'm preaching to you. In your notes, as a follower of Jesus, you're called to be accepting without being approving. There's a big difference between accepting and approving. We're called to accept everyone. We say, come as you are. No perfect people are allowed. Just come as you are, broken and messed up as you are. Come, come with whatever baggage you have, come. But it doesn't mean that we approve of everything. This is, this, this is to have compassion, but without compromise. I can have compassion on someone without compromising my beliefs. Jesus says that we are to accept everyone to show love to everyone, to accept everyone, whether single or married or, or divorced or, or remarried or straight or bi or gay or whatever. We are to accept everyone. Jesus died for every single person. He loves every single person. And as a result, we are to show love and compassion to every single person out there. But here is the hard news, that God doesn't approve of everything you do. The world, they tolerate everything. They tolerate everything. But God does not approve of everything. In fact, in your notes, the world is hostile towards holiness. 
Whenever there's holiness, the world gets really hostile towards it. They, whenever, because, why? Why does the world get so hostile towards holiness? Because when the light shines, it illuminates all the darkness. It illuminates everything else, and people feel exposed. And they don't want to feel exposed anymore. And God's light shines through you, and as a result, they get hostile, say, shut off that light. We don't want anybody to see what we're doing over here. This is the toughest of the seven letters, I hope. <laughs> And honestly, I don't want to alienate you. I don't want to alienate anybody because we love you wherever you are, whatever situation you're But And I didn't write this, okay? I didn't write it. I'm just a messenger. I'm just here reading it. So instead of, instead of trying to change God's word, maybe let's let God's word change us. Starting with me, starting with me, let's let God's word change us. See, our life is to be conformed to Jesus. And your notes... Your life should be conformed to Jesus and not the culture, not the world. Our life should be conformed, should be shaped into the image of Jesus, not the world around us. It's, it's like a, a plumb line. Seen these before? You would hold this up, and when it gets perfectly still, you can go, you can hold it up against a wall, you can hold it up against a board, you can hold it up against any number of things, and you can tell if something is level, if it's lined up or not. This plumb line will always be straight. Everything else in the world might be crooked, but this is the standard by which we measure what is vertical. See, Jesus is like this plumb line saying, here, is what I want you to measure yourselves to. I don't want you to measure yourself to each other. I don't want you to measure yourself by the world around you. I don't want you to measure yourself by the popular person on Instagram or by the movie uh, star or by the singer or by whoever. Jesus is our plumb line, the one by which we are to be measured, not by these other things in this world. So there's this Jezebel spirit of tolerance in this world, but it's sin. And I know this is hard, and, and I'm worried that I'll offend some people, but this is what Christians have believed for over 2,000 years. And our main goal needs to be not to offend Jesus and what he's done. Let's continue on. 21, I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from him, her immorality. Therefore, I'll throw her on a bed of suffering and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. I'll strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every single person. And I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. Wow, these are heavy words. Man, he says he's coming with these eyes of fire. He's gonna see, he's gonna see everything. He goes on though and says, says do you have Ears to hear. Do you have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, or are we covering our ear? I don't want to hear that. I don't agree with that. I don't want to hear that because we care more about our happiness than our holiness. In your notes, our holiness is more important than our happiness. Did you know that, that, that being holy before God is more important than about fulfilling my desires in life? No, don't shoot the messenger. I'm sorry. I already apologized to you. Don't shoot me because of it. I'm, I'm as uncomfortable with this as maybe some of you, but I have to deliver this with conviction because we live in a culture of compromise. We live in a culture where everything has everyone's approval. And if you stand up for what's true and right, you're ostracized as a bigot. And, and I don't think that's fair because I love people and I certainly know Jesus loves them even more than I did. In your notes, we need to live with conviction not compromise. We need to live with conviction in our life. Are we convicted about things? Do we live our life, not, not judging people, not pointing the finger, but living a life of conviction, saying, I, I'm gonna follow the teachings of Jesus even if I don't entirely want to. Even if it's easier for me to do something else, I'm not gonna live a life of compromise. So where's the hope in all of this? Man. I mean, if we just leave it here, I mean, that's kind of down. So where's the hope? Here, here's the hope. Romans 8.1. It says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. 
Uh, underline those words, no condemnation. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. God's kindness leads us to repentance. Finally, there's some good news that God is not out there looking to condemn you. God is not out there looking to point the finger to expose your sin, simply to hurt you. God did not send his son Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. That's why Jesus came. Not so that he could condemn us, not so we feel bad about ourselves, but so that no one would perish, but all of us would have eternal life because Jesus put his righteousness on us. And we need to be the ones that change, that transform, that are made into Jesus' image. In your notes, we don't change God, but God is the one who changes us. He is the one who changes us. We don't change him to God, I don't agree with you. He said, oh, well, I'm sorry, let me just change. No, we're the ones that are called to change. Jesus says to repent, to turn, to turn away from those old things, to change how you think, to live your life. And we hear the word repent, and some of us feel very negatively about it, like it's like, oh, well, you're, you're just a big screw-up. No, repent is God begging us, say, please turn around, you're going the wrong way. And instead of arrogance, as you hear these words, maybe, maybe we need to say, maybe how I'm thinking is wrong. Maybe it's not God that's thinking wrong. Maybe it's me that's thinking wrong. Maybe it's me that's living wrong. So this is good news. Christianity, it starts with tolerance and welcomes everyone in, but then it moves to repentance. Christianity starts with tolerance, but moves to repentance. This is why at Thrive Church, we say, come as you are, and it was dot, 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 but don't stay that way. Come as you are, broken and messed up, but don't stay that way. Start moving towards Jesus. Everyone is welcome into the family of God, and everyone is invited to change and experience the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. We can't tell God, oh, you're just old-fashioned. Imagine that, God, you're just old-fashioned. Really? I am the beginning and the end. I am the first and the last. You're the one getting the gray hair. You're the one that's aging. You're the one that's sore in the morning. I'm not the one that's dying. I'm not the one that's changing. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you're the one that changes. So then Jesus ends this with some encouragement. Woo, thank you, Lord. Verse 24. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching. Deeper truths, as they call them, depths of Satan, actually. Because I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. And to all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all nations. They will rule the nations with an iron fist rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I received from my father and I will also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he's saying to the church. He's saying for those of you that haven't compromised and maybe for those of you that have, it's time to turn around and hold on, hold tightly, hold on to these things. Hold tightly to what you have until I come. These, this is Jesus's final words to a world drowning in compromise. Hold on. Hold on. It's not going to last forever, but hold on. Hold on. When somebody calls you a, a goody two-shoes for not drinking and getting drunk and hooking up with other people, then just hold on. You know, hold on when, when your, your boyfriend threatens to dump you because, because you're not going to go along with whatever he says. Just hold on. Hold on when your co-workers treat you like a prude because you don't want to go to the strip club with them. Hold on because those who hold on will be rewarded. So is Jesus talking to you today? And I find this personally challenging. Like, what am I tolerating in my own life? This past week, my wife and I sat down to watch some TV. We're scrolling through Netflix, and I saw a TV show. I'm like, oh, maybe we should watch this show. It's, it's really funny. It's, it's, it's a little crass and off color, but it's funny. And she looked at me and said, didn't you just preach about this? I'm like, ah. Oh. Like, yeah, maybe we should watch something else. I'd already watched the whole series before though. <laughs> I'm just being real. Like, like it's not you, it's me. Like, what, what am I tolerating in my life? 
What am I tolerating? I think today there's two kinds of people that are hearing this. There's those who are convicted about their compromise. Let me challenge you that you can have Jezebel or you can have Jesus, but you can't have both. You can have Jesus or you can have the culture of this world, but you're probably not going to be able to have both. And to you, I would challenge to change your mind, change your life, change your focus. And the others are those who are, are hurting. And there's hope for the hurting. Maybe you're afraid and, and, and you have some some secret sins in the past. Maybe you have hurts in the past. Maybe you have some big regrets. And the whole time I'm preaching, you're saying, say, will he just pray so I can get out of here and get to my car as fast as possible? Because I'm done with this. So what is God saying to you right now? Because I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what you're going through right now. But Jesus is calling you to repent. This is not like, like he's not beating something over your head saying, well, well, you've just messed up. You've just gone too far. He's saying, please turn around. You're going the wrong way. The way you're going leads to death and destruction. Come and repent and live a new life. The final thing in your notes is that sometimes God's truth hurts, but God's truth never harms. It may hurt a little bit, but it's not there to harm you. It's there to build you. It's there to heal you. You know, a, a while back, I was out walking one morning, as I tend to do sometimes. And uh, as I was walking down the road, I saw a dime on the ground, and I walked by it. Probably as many of us do. I don't need loose pocket change. I, I pay everything with a credit card, so I don't want change. And I walked by it, and I felt the Lord say, pick up the dime. I'm like, like, why? I, I Like, that's too much effort. I'm getting older now, you know? I got to bend over, then I got to get back up again. Like, like, what in the world? So I'm, like, debating whether or not I should pick up this dime. And finally, I stooped down, and I picked it up, and I held it there. And, and I felt God very clearly saying to me, says, so this is what I've done to you. I reached down. Something that you didn't think was very worth, worth a whole lot. I reached down, and I picked it up, and I hold you in the palm of my hand. And, and I'm giving you worth. Maybe in and of itself, the dime doesn't seem like it's worth a lot, but I am giving you worth because I love you. And I, and I reach down from heaven to earth. I sent Jesus down from heaven to earth to pick you up, to lift you up out of that mess that you were in. And as I was walking, the, 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 the dime fell out of my hand. And you know what I did? As soon as it hit the ground, I reached down and I picked it back up again. I'm like, and I realized that it had more value now than it did before. I didn't even think about it to pick it up that time because I realized that I had already given it value by picking it up. And I said, this is mine. Oh, oh it fell out of my hand. This is mine. I'm going to pick that back up again because this has worth to me now. This has value to me. And Jesus is reaching down to pick you up. I don't know if it's the first time or whether it's the 101st time, but he's reaching down saying, you have value. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to change you. I'm here to help you so you can move forward, so you can live the life that I have for you. And, and I know some of this is hard, but it's the truth. And scripture says that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That Christ can heal your heart. You aren't people who are perfect. You're not sitting around people who are perfect. In fact, you're not listening to someone who's perfect, but we are forgiven. And that's what makes all the difference. That he will forgive you. He will give you a new heart. He will make you a new creation. But we need to repent. We need to turn from him. Not dabble in the things of the world. Not compromise these things. Not give the approval of things that we know displease God. Let's seek him first with all that we have. Let's stand together and, and repent. I, I didn't say if you need to repent, stand. Because that's kind of awkward, right? It's like, oh, well. Look who's standing. You know, we all need to. We all need to stand and repent of some things, turn from some things. So let's repent. Let's turn from our ways. Let's pray together. I'll say it first, and why don't you repeat after me? Heavenly Father, we come to you now in Jesus' name, and we are sorry for chasing the things of this world 
for giving approval to the things of this world. I'm not going to compromise anymore. I'm choosing to follow you. You are my Lord. Thank you for sending Jesus, not to condemn me, but to love me and to include me in his family. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing here. Thank you, Lord, for, for working in hearts right now, hearts that have maybe been hard to you, hearts that maybe have wandered far away. Thank you for working now. Thank you for inspiring change in lives. Thank you for drawing this line in the sand for us to say we, we're, we're not going to live this life anymore. We're not going to be like the city of Thyatira any longer. Embracing the compromise of the world, embracing the idols of the world, embracing the, 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 the sexual uh, promiscuity of the world, but we are choosing to follow you regardless of the cost, regardless of the price. And we thank you and we praise you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, and everybody says amen and amen.